Hey, I want to welcome everybody back to our Thursday night service here at Hegwish. Uh, I'm chomping at the bit. I'm, I feel like, you know, just floating here with the Lord because I'm going to do some preaching tonight. And I'm excited because I was very blessed today. You know, I was uh, had a tough week, had a tough few weeks. Um, I'm always very blessed, but, you know, a lot of things have been going on. And uh, somebody encouraged me this morning through Hebrews chapter 10 and Man, little did they know that, and you know, first off, Hebrews is my favorite book. Um, and, you know, chapter 10 uh, culminizes of the, you know, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And, and so, you know, I, I read the verses that, uh, that they sent me. Uh, very encouraging. That family always encourages me. Uh, and as I'm reading it, I'm like, oh, yeah, Lord, you know. Well, then. I wanted to put it into its proper context, so I went back and, you know, I'm reading and think, well, I need to put what I was reading in its context to put that other thing in its context, and and uh, those verses 35 through 37, and and uh, so I went back to the beginning of 10, and I'm reading, I'm like, oh, Lord, and it, I I'm just like, oh, you know, it's such a blessing, you know, I'm thinking, well, Lord, I mean, I can't read 10 without nine, you know, and then you know, but you can't read nine without reading eight and you can't do eight without seven. I mean, in this particular part of the scripture for me is it's not golden nuggets. It's chunks of gold because Hebrews five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 clearly explain in um, ways that, you know, simple minds can understand that Jesus did it all. Uh, this is peat and repeat of what Jesus did when he went to the cross. And there are numerous comparisons in the Old Testament uh, that are being used from the Old Testament to show that Jesus did better than that and more and more complete. And, and you know, it's just by the time you get to 10 in the book of Hebrews, it, it's just so loaded down with truth that you just you just can't sit there and believe that you can lose your salvation. You, you, you just can't, okay? I mean, you can't read 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And I'm a very simple-minded person. You may not all think that, but I am. If you don't believe it, just ask me. And uh, um, if I get it, you can get it too. But so to get to 10... Uh, maybe we'll go back, but it's because of chapter 9. So we're going to start out uh, in 10. I'm, hopefully I'm going to be preaching here. And we're going to take a pause here in just a second because I got a reference out of Colossians chapter 2. So if you want to if you want a thumb or finger, let your fingers walk over to Colossians chapter 2. We might be there for a couple minutes also. So here the writer, whoever uh, the writer of Hebrews is, the Holy Spirit, uh, says, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of things, can never with those sacrifices which they, the priests, the daily priests, offered year by year on and on and on ad nauseum, uh, continually uh, make the comers thereto, thereunto perfect, or in, in the Greek it says complete. See, the law was just a shadow of good things to come. You know how shadows are. They're there and they're not. You know, you see your shadow, like when the sun comes to you from the back, and you see your image, but it doesn't see you. It just sees an image of you. And, and, and the writer here says that the law was just a shadow uh, of good things to come, not the very image of those things. But it can never with the sacrifices that those priests did daily, their, their service unto God, uh, offered year by year, continually make those that would come complete. Now, I can't, so let's go ahead and stop there. That word, that word complete is a very good word. Uh, Colossians chapter 2. Okay, real quick out of, out of, out of Colossians chapter 2. Uh, we're going to see, uh, starting in verse 6 of Colossians chapter 2, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, either you, we received him or we didn't. 
okay? And he had therefore, uh, he that therefore has received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in him, rooted, that means let your roots go deep, and then built up in him, without the roots going deep, you're not going to be built up, uh, and then established in what? The faith. We must be established in faith, not by things we think, not by things we think, by things we feel, not by the way we were raised, not by the way even our parents raised us, okay? Jesus Christ supersedes all those things. So rooted and built up in him, established in faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, uh, as, ye, as we have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Now, listen, are, are we abounding? We can go over into, into Second Peter and, and see, you know, about all these things that we're supposed to be abounding in. You know, because either we're abounding because if our Christianity is this, well, that's not Christianity, okay? That, that's, that's, that's lackadaisical nothing. So we need to be rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, being uh, as we've been taught, okay? Hopefully you've been taught that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, abounding therein with thanksgiving, but beware lest anybody spoil you through vain, I'm sorry, through philosophy and vain, useless deceit after the rudiments of men, I'm sorry, after the traditions, the precepts of men, after the rudiments of the world. Now, the rudiments of the world is where the foundation of witchcraft also comes in uh, because Satan is the god of this world. And Jesus, when we got saved, took us from this world into the next, and he made us to be ambassadors just here on earth. Because in him, verse 9, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, okay? In him, in him dwells just about all the fullness, but not quite all the fullness, because see, you know, uh, fill my cup, Lord. Great song, fill my cup. But brothers and sisters, if you're born again, your cup is always full, okay? You should actually hopefully be drinking from the saucer of your cup because your blessings are slosh, sloshing uh, out, out, of, out of the brim of the cup. And you say, well, I see other people, they just seem to have a, you know, more blessings than I do. No, your cup is this big and their cup is this big. Okay? And that comes through our obedience. It's required of a steward that we be found faithful or obedience because in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the of the Godhead bodily. And a lot of us say, amen to that. And you and me are complete. See, there's that word now. We are complete in him, which is the head of all principles and powers, in whom also we are circumcised. And this is important because remember, on the eighth day, the, 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 the males were circumcised, and circumcis circumcision was the seal that you belong to God. Okay, so now all of us, since we're now, you know, now in your gender, you have a responsibility, and Paul and Peter, and Jay, they all talk about this, okay? But in God's eyes, okay, as people, okay, we're all the same, okay? Neither male nor female. There's, there's no more difference anymore. There was a difference at one time, but there is no more. You know, we're all one in Christ. Now we have different functions within our gender, okay? We have different functions in the different things. The hand can't be the nose and, and the ear can't be the eye, so to speak. Uh, so uh, it says now that you know, in whom now we are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, ouch, in putting on the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And I'd like to go on, but we need we need to get back get back to Hebrews uh, chapter ten. So putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, the sins because that's where sin is. See, when you're born again, your spirit gets born again. Sin can't touch that, okay? Because we're one hundred percent body, one hundred percent soul, and one hundred percent spirit. And when we walk in the spirit, we don't fulfill the loss of the flesh. Amen. Galatians. And but when we walk in the flesh, okay, when we sin, it brings death to our lives, not physical death, but it can bring physical death. But you know, we don't die instantly of that, but we feel like we do, okay? It doesn't send us to hell, we just feel like we're living in hell. Why? Because we're doing our own thing. This is this is why 
so many walk away from the church or they just they put on their Christianity like they like they put on their clothes to go to church. Oh, do I look okay? You know, hey, let me on, let me hang on. straighten out, button up my sleeves here. You know, a lot of people are like that. They got to look good in church. How about we just look good to God? I think that would be better. But moving on, okay. Uh, so those sacrifices, which were offered year by year continually, won't make the comers perfect. It won't make them complete. We're complete in Christ, Colossians 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, question mark, right? Because the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. Ooh, conscience, consciousness. Our conscience is, it's, it's a part of our soul. And when we become born again, soul, our soul is on the same level as animals. An unregenerated person, their soul uh, is on, and it, basically it is now too, if you're born again, but there's a difference. Because once we were quickened and made alive in the spirit, it revived things in us to put our foot down. You know, when the Lord, when the Lord saved me, I went to bed, just the, the, the biggest and greatest of all sinners on earth. And I went to bed and I was, you know, just all messed up and just really, really messed up. And I read Somebody Goofed, a chick track. And at the end of the track, the, this young man uh, who followed this good looking guy and they were driving around in a sports car. And I, you know, I, I had a 68 Camaro and, and um, Craiger mags and, and, you know, and just thought I was cool. And, and, you know, the guy who tried out on a train in the, in the track and the train killed him and they opened up their eyes in hell. And he went to this guy and says, Hey, you know, Man, you goofed, man. All those things you told me about. And, and that guy took off his, his face. His, you know, it was his big, I don't know if they're still red, but there was a devil. It was, you know, these are black and white comics. And, uh, and uh, it was red. And it says, no, you goofed. That, hence the name of the track, somebody goofed. I felt bad for that kid. And there was a little prayer on the next page, the last page of that track. And I prayed it. I meant it. I mean, I, I was, I was sincere. I felt bad for him, you know, that, that he was tricked. You know, nobody, lo who likes to be chumped? You know, who likes to be tricked? So uh, he went to, I went to sleep and I, I woke up saved. And I'm sitting at, at the kitchen table and I, I don't remember. I, you know, for a few minutes I'm sitting there, I open up the newspaper and, and I hear this voice that says, son, it's wrong to do drugs. And I was like, oh, I'm going to quit doing drugs. Come on. Do you know how many people try to get me to stop doing drugs? And here was this voice that I'd never heard before. It said, son, it's wrong to do drugs. And I was like, oh, i got to stop doing drugs. And I was a drug dealer. So I don't know, a few seconds later, a minute later, I don't remember. I'm sitting there just pondering, oh, I'm going to stop doing drugs. This dead voice comes back and says, son, it's wrong to sell drugs. I'm thinking, well, i got to stop selling drugs. See, that's what the Lord does. That's what happens when you get saved. You go from darkness to light. Even though our soul is still the same, when we, be, when we get quickened, we start working on that soul out of our heart, which is, which is the center of our life, our soul, the way we think, the way we feel, the way we act, and the way we react. And I know we can break this down to its lowest common denominator and get into psychology, but we're not going to do that. Okay, we're going to keep it simple. And, and what the Lord is showing us uh, when he talks about um, the worshipers uh, once purged should have no more conscience of sins. Brothers and sisters, we too should have no more conscience of sins because when our conscience is revived because we're born again, what happens in our soul is the Holy Spirit starts working there and he, the conscience, looks out. And it looks this way, and it looks this way. And being led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, I want you to go this way. But if we're led by the flesh, the flesh says, no, I want you to go this way. And our conscience is going back and forth on what should we do. And through our obedience, through our faith, 
Okay, not, not not being coerced. We're not being coerced by the Holy Spirit. Being encouraged by us exercising our faith, we choose. Okay, volition. The second greatest gift we ever got after salvation is free will, or, or what's called volition. You know, we have free will within the things that God allows us to have free will in. Only God has free will, but. Uh, you know, we're, we're constricted or restricted in the things that God wants us to be, but we are, we, we can choose these things in our lives. And so, uh, so the writer writes here, so then would they not have ceased to have been offered? Well, sure they would, because that the worshipers, us, once, once, this is very important, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. And we sit around say, oh, Lord, and we wring our hands because, you know, God, God, you just don't know how bad I am. And God says, no, son, no, daughter, I, I do know how bad you are. Yeah, I, I know, but God, you know, some, I, you know, I, so many people, I, I'm just having such a hard time, you know, doing the right thing. God says, yes, that, that's why, that's why I saved you. Yeah, but God, you know, really, I mean, I got this going on, I got that going on, and, you know, my mom and dad, and Yes, son. Yes, daughter. That's why I saved you. And we keep running these excuses before God of why we're bad and why, you know, God, I mean, how, how, how can you love me? Well, because my word says that I loved you with a great love and that's why I saved you. Yeah, but God, I mean, we just keep going back to God with, with all these, with all these things like, God, how can you love me? Well, because God is love. And, and see, once we start to get it, you know, God, I'm just so rotten. Yes, son. Yes, daughter. You are very rotten. And that's why I saved you. But God, I'm just, oh, that's a hard God to stop sinning. I just I want to do right thing. And God says, yes, son. Yes, daughter. That's why I saved you. It's that simple. Because once we get saved, this, this consciousness, this conscience of sins should be purged from us so that we're not sitting there wringing our hands. Because do you know that when, since, you've been, since you've become born again, and I know you say, well, what I'm going to tell you now, you're just going to flip out. You're just going to say, it just can't be true. Okay? But the real you, okay, the real Emily, Kim, Tasha, Jason, Cecilia, Charlotte, Casas, all of you, the real us hasn't once sinned. I know you, I'm going to lose some of you. We haven't once sinned since we got saved. Why? Because your flesh didn't get saved, but your spirit did. Your spirit got sealed until the day of redemption. And that seal is, is we're sealed through the Holy Spirit of promise. We're promised. The, these, this divine nature that's been given to us, okay, Peter talks about this, and we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We've been given the earnest of the Spirit. That means, that means the price has been paid. Jesus paid the price. We don't see, we see through the glass darkly right now, but when we see him as he is, we'll be just like him. We won't be Jesus, but we'll be just like him. We won't be able to sin anymore, but in your spirit, which is, which is that thing, that Holy Spirit that's inside of you, that is now part of you, that's part of us. We're part of it. It's part of us. Okay. We, 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 we're adopted. We're, we're adopted into this family. If you're a Jew, you know, it's different, a little bit different, same salvation. But um, for us as Gentiles, you know, we're, we're adopted in now. The laws of adoption, I don't know if they've changed, but a long time ago, I haven't looked at it in a long time. The laws of adoption were, you know, because children can disown their parents, but but if you're adopted, you can't disown your adopted parents, uh, and 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 they can't disown you. You can't eman eman emancipate yourself, and you and your parents can't disown you uh, because of the laws of adoption. Now we're adopted into God's family, whether you like it or not. You know, and and you know, you say, well, I just don't know if I do the right thing. I like to do this like that. Well, fine, then go ahead and do that. You know, and you you'll live. You won't go to hell for doing it, but you'll just live a life of hell, and you'll have you'll wake up morning, noon, and night to have hell in your life. But it's the only hell that you'll ever have. Now, for the lost, this is the only heaven they'll ever have. So we see that, so when we sit around, see, and we just don't know. We, we just have a hard time understanding that when we got saved, the deal was done. 
The price was paid. We, we can't take our hand. We can't take ourselves out of our Father's hand. We can't take our hands out of our Savior's hand. You know, and I know that everybody says, well, I know that that can't be done except for this. No, there's no, there's no exceptions, okay? Because either you're born again or you're not. The problem today isn't loss of salvation. The problem today is salvation, period. Okay, if you're born of God, 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God does not sin because his seed, sperm, or Holy Spirit remains, remains in him, neither can he sin because he's born of God. Now, that's the spiritual side of us. Now, we still live, we still have a body of flesh, and that's how we work out our salvation. We don't have to work, we don't have to work out our salvation, our spirit. It's done. It's taken care of. You're going to heaven. Again, whether you like it or not, you're going to heaven. God gave you enough faith. He gifted you. We are saved by grace, Ephesians 2. We are saved by grace through faith. That faith is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. Lest we should say, hey, God, look what I did. We didn't do anything. Not one of us did anything to get saved. God in his great love saved us. He knew an eternity past. He didn't choose us. Well, he chose us because he knew that we were going to get saved. But he, in his foreknowledge, okay, he didn't predestine us to get saved. He, he, in, he did, but he did that in his foreknowledge of us. Okay, he can't predestine somebody to get saved that's not going to repent. I mean, that's not going to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Well, let me rephrase that. It, it, it's, it's, such a, it's such a fine line. It's such a, a delicate thing for us to just say, okay, well, Lord, if that's what you did, because that's what the Word of God says. Okay, we are saved by grace through faith. That faith is not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. So God gifted us with enough faith to get from hell to heaven. Now that, that in between on our, on our gravestone, okay, that dash of, of when we're born to when we die, that's our responsibility. But we still get to the other side in heaven. Let, 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 let's show this how the Word of God says. Because it says in those sacrifices, uh, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year remember because every year well every day okay through the errors through the wrongs the sins of, of the errors are things that people did ignorantly and then of course there's willful sin out there and hopefully we'll get to the willful sin I'm gonna have to get to the willful sin here here in chapter 10 and so i've got to move along a little faster here um because this is such a big deal brothers and sisters this is just monumental so uh, what happens is we, you know, people would take to the priest their their offering every day, and they would they would you know if they did the right thing, you know they did their service to God, which was every day for us. But then once a year, somebody you know the high priest went in to the holy of holies, and it says in those sacrifices there's a remembrance again made of sins every year because the sins weren't weren't forgiven; they were just covered, okay, because it wasn't possible. It's impossible, verse 4, that in the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Well, what happened? God covered them until, until we had to make that offering again. Okay, they, they were uncovered then. Then they had to be covered again. And then for the group, for the congregation, for all, the high priest went in once a year, throwing the blood everywhere, you know, on the mercy seat, the mercy seat propitiation uh, of Jesus Christ. That's what the mercy seat was in the Old Testament, is the propitiation of Jesus Christ in our life now. Because it wasn't possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. So wherefore, when he cometh into the world, speaking of Jesus, he said, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body, my body, has thou prepared. Now you'll find that quote in, in, in Psalm 40, verse 6, Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, about this body, this physical body that was coming. Jesus is speaking of his body. Uh, remember Philippians 2, 7 tells us that, that he was made in the likeness of men, okay? I mean, here God left his throne, came to earth in the form of a person, okay? And it was the person, it was the man, Christ Jesus, that walked the earth. No, the Holy Spirit didn't walk the earth. He, he was there, but he wasn't the one, you know, the three are one, but separate. God wasn't one. God didn't go to the cross. His son, Jesus Christ, did. Because that price of sin had to be paid. It's very, very important that we understand this. Because these are, this is the three, but being one, but separate. And you say, well, how can God do that? The same way he does us, body, soul, and spirit. We were 100% body, 100% soul, 100% spirit. Here we are as one 
yet those things are separate within us. Well, that's just crazy. No, that's faith, brothers and sisters. And when God creates us, does the potter say to the clay, I'm sorry, does the clay say to the potter, why don't you make me this way? No. Why don't we just live it up to how God created us when we became born again? And let's move on, brothers and sisters. Let's leave the baby bottles behind. Let's, let's leave all the confusion. Oh, you know, once saved, always saved. If you're saved, you can't unsave yourself. Period. That's it. It's done. The problem today isn't loss of salvation. The problem is that the churches and the pulpits are just stuffed to the rafters with people who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They read about him in a book, somebody taught him in a university, or, or somebody, whatever, whatever people are there for, you know, like Pastor Rudy used to say, you know, uh, mama called, papa sent. Mama always wanted a preacher in the family, so papa sent him to college. You know, that's a lot of what's going on here. So, so we're told, uh, verse 7, then said I, Jesus, uh, um, I'm sorry, verse, verse 5, wherefore, when he cometh in the world, he said, sacrifice and offering. You don't want that anymore, God. It's a stench to your nostrils. Check, check out Ezekiel, uh, his, his version uh, of how God feels about these, this, these sacrifices and offerings. He says, but my body you've prepared. See, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you didn't have any pleasure anymore because you were working for God. See, we don't work for God anymore. We work with God. If you're working for God, forget it. You, you can't work for God. There's nothing you can do except in obedience. See, see, in the Old Testament, you had to be good because God said, if you're good, okay, I will bless you with this. And if you're good, I will bless you with this. And if you're good, I will bless you with this. But you had to do all those things. Well, now we're made good. Let's read about that. You say, well, I don't deserve it. And God sits in heaven and says, yes, I know. That's why I saved you. But it, it just doesn't make any sense. I know, son. I know, daughter. But that's why I saved you. So in, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. You didn't want people working for God. It just didn't work. So then I said, lo, I come in the volume of the book. In other words, all over the book, it's, it's written of me uh, to do thy will, O God. Isn't it interesting? Jesus came to do the will of the Father. Isn't that something? You know, because a lot of people think, oh, boy, that Jesus, boy, he had these powers. Remember when he went to Canaan, the first miracle, and he made the water into grape juice, okay, not wine. Talk about that probably Sunday. Uh, but uh, I'm going to talk about more of the alcohol stuff on Sunday. I just feel so good, man. I'm just, I love to preach this stuff because, brothers and sisters, this is where it's all at. So, he, he says um, that, you know, to do thy will, O God. So how did Jesus know to go to Canaan? I mean, did he have, you know, like the politicians, they get every time they get into the limo to go to work, you know, they're giving a, uh, they're giving a clipboard. This is not a clipboard. Just pretend it is. Okay. They get a clipboard. Okay. This is what you're going to say to me. This is what you're going to do. These are the buzzwords. Okay. These are the talking points. And this is all you're going to do. And they, it's like a script. It, it's almost like everything in politics is, 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 is uh, you know, is choreographed. <laughs> Come on. I mean, really? Yeah, really. But moving on. So how did, how did Jesus know to go, to go to the wedding feast at Canaan? Because his father told him to do that. He didn't go there on his own. He went there because his father told him that. How did he, and how did he know that? Because he spent time with his father. He spent prayer time with his father. He spent alone time, so he wasn't being distracted by the disciples. He spent private time with his father, and his father says, I want you to go here. I want you to go here. I don't want you to go here because there's not going to be a lot of things that you can do here, so I'm going to go here, and I'm going to send you to some people that don't even belong to the household of God just to show the Israelites, just to show my people what they're missing. I'm blessing the unjust because I'm sovereign and I can do whatever I want. I'm blessing the unjust. Don't you remember when, when Jesus told them, I went, I went here, I went there, and they got so mad at him 
because you couldn't do that. Oh, oh sacrilege, oi vey. You know, you, you can't go over there, Jesus. You must be a heathen. No, he couldn't go to them because they wouldn't believe. That's all the Lord wants us to do is believe in him. You say, well, I don't have a lot of a lot of belief, but you have enough that got you from hell to heaven. Believe it. So he says, I've come to do your will, O oh God. Uh, above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither had uh, pleasure therein, uh, which are offered by the law. Then said he again, he said, listen, guys, I'm trying to tell you, lo, I come to do thy will, O oh God. He takes away the first so that he may establish the second. Look back. Last verse of chapter 8. Last verse of chapter 8. He, got, he says a new covenant, he, he has, because he, he made the first one old. And now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. And so when Jesus came, the old, the, the law, and all that, all that, all those law keepers that are out there, man, you guys are, you're working for God and God's never going to bless you. God doesn't want you to work for him. There's nothing you can do except to, to exhibit and exercise your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone, period, period. You don't even have to have a Bible to do that. It's good to have a Bible because we get to know certain things by God. But if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you don't need anything else. <laughs> What's it say? We don't need a preacher to tell us about things. We just need the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to lead you away from the feast days. Make sure you're saved, brothers and sisters. You believe in, in that Sabbath keeping and you believe in those laws and you believe that you need to follow this, that you're working for God. And God says, it's a stench to my nostrils. You can't do anything to please me, God says. The only thing you can do, <coughs> excuse me, is to follow what I'm telling you here about my son. So I come to do thy will. God, he takes away the first, he did away with the Old Testament so that he may establish the second one, which is the new covenant that we have. By the which will, we are sanctified. Do you know what it means to be sanctified? It means to be set apart. It means to be, this is in the Greek. It means to be freed from the guilt of sin. <clears throat> no, we're not freed from the guilt of sin. Oh God, how can you stand me? God says, I can't. That's why I saved you. That's why my son died for you. Because I can't stand you. I can't have you before me because you're all filthy. None are righteous. No, not one, the Bible says. Not one. So God had to save us. So when he sees us and our filth and our rottenness and, and how wretched we are, when he sees you and me that are born again, what does he see? He sees the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see us. He can't look at us like, like that. He has to turn his head from that sin. So it, it says that, <clears throat> well, I'm uh, speaking a little loud, so not like Pastor Charlie, man. He doesn't cough. He has one of those speaking voices. I don't. Non-alcoholic beverage, brothers. Alcohol should never, ever touch the lips of a priest or a king, when you're born again, you're made to be kings and priests. Revelation chapter 5. We'll talk about that on Sunday. By the which will, we are sanctified. Now listen, we're either sanctified or we're not, brothers and sisters. If you're not sanctified, you better get born again. Now if you're born again, you're sanctified. Now listen, just accept that. It just, I just don't understand it. God says, I know. That's why I saved you. Because we don't get it. We can't earn it. There's nothing we can do. We can't work for God. We can work with God through obedience. <clears throat> Again, in the Old Testament, people were good because God said, if you're good, I'm going to grant you this. Now, now we don't good, do good for our salvation. We do good because of our salvation. It's, it's just night and day difference. You know, get away from that, from that law and Sabbath stuff. Jesus says he's Lord of the Sabbath. So you know what day is the Sabbath? not Saturday anymore. It's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay? It's every day of the week. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. And when do we worship Jesus? Well, when I'm in trouble. No, no, I'm not talking about the reality of it. When, do, when are we supposed to worship, worship Jesus? Every single day in our life. By the which will, we are sanctified <clears throat> through the offering 
of the body of Jesus Christ. Look at it, brothers and sisters. Be open to chapter 10, verse 10. By the which will, we, that's you and me, are sanctified, set apart. Be, we're being freed from the, from the guilt of sin through the offering of the body of Jesus. Well, when I go to church and I do the Lord's Supper, it doesn't say that. Well, you know, when I repent of my sins, it doesn't say that. Well, if you're born again, you know, yeah, we should be repenting of our sins, but all the Lord, all the Lord wants to hear, no, we'll, we'll talk about that later. By the which, well, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Go back in chapter 9. Okay? So Jesus uh, went into the second, okay, the Holy of Holies, uh, uh, went where the high priest went alone. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's not, it is, it is. So sorry. Um, Verse, verse 26, uh, talking about Jesus. Uh, well, the high priest, you know, this is chapter 9 is talking about how, what the high priest had to do. It's just verbatim, uh, it's just uh, um, repeat, 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 so, so the Jews can get it that, you know, see, the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews to tell the Hebrews it's to, to stop being Hebrews. Uh, because Christ has not entered a holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the truth, but he's entered into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us, for us, 24-7, he doesn't sleep. He's in heaven now for you and me. Not that he, <coughs> nor yet that he should offer himself often. Remember, that's what the high priest had to do, or that's what the priests had to do. They had to do it often. And then the high priest did enter into the holy places every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, in the end of the world, at the end of it all, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. <clears throat> so Jesus, look at, verse 30, look at verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, those, those that come to him, and unto them that look to him, uh, and unto them that look for him in, in hope and in faith, in, in patience, uh, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. In other words, when it's over, you're good, you're free, you're, you're there. <coughs> we see through that glass darkly now, it says. Moving on, I just have a few minutes left here. So, by the which will, we are sanctified, set apart, made free from the guilt of sin through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily ministering and offering. Oftentimes, see, it just continues. It just continues to tell the Jews, stop. Stop already. Okay? We're telling you, God, I'm telling you what you used to do, and I'm telling you now what I am doing. Because the old has been put away, and the new is now, is what God is doing. Okay? For every high priest stands daily. And, and oft times, offering, oft times, the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Boom! Bam! As, as Emeril, the chef, would say. Bam! That's what it is. This man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. Well, what sacrifice did he offer? Well, let's, let's look at this. From henceforth, expecting, waiting, till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, this is talking about Jesus, for by one offering, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified, those that are set apart. He has sanctified you forever. Whereof the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is now the covenant that I will make, with them after those days, saith the Lord, I'm going to put my laws into their hearts and their minds. I'm going to write them. See, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside. It's not a bunch of handwritten things anymore. Okay? When we listen to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit tells us what to do. Get rid of the spirits of, of deception. Get, get rid of the spirits of passivity. Get rid of the demons of doubt and unbelief. Get rid of the demons. Get deliverance. 
He says, he says, I'm going to write these things in their heart and their minds. And these demons are on the inside. And go, no, 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 this, this can't happen. This can't happen. And we're thinking with our carnal mind. We're thinking with our flesh instead of thinking because the spirit wars against the flesh. The flesh wars against the spirit. And both are contrary one to another. So we can't do the things we want to do. <coughs> so who wins? The spiritual side wins. It just all depends on what side, what spiritual side we're looking at. So, so in those days, Jesus said, oh man, excuse me, I'm going to put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, I'm going to write them. And their sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. Oh, come on. God, you can't. God, how, how, how can you, how can you not remember my sins anymore? Because where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. And because I'm not going to have the time, I'm going to have to skip just a man, real quick. Okay, and their sins and iniquities, I'll remember no more. It's kind of like on a globe, okay? On a globe. I don't have a globe here. I have a flat, flat one. I don't have a globe. On a globe, if you start north, if you go north, if you're at the top north, and you go south, you get to the south. But if you start east and you go west, you never get west. You always go east. Okay? Because God tells us he separates our sins as far as the east is from the west. They, they never come together. So, so where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Where there is remission of these. Now, oh, mine aren't all remission. Well, then you're lost. Then you're a lost person. Get yourself saved. And you're going to have all your sins because this covenant I'm going to make with them after those days, after the days of the Old Testament, say it the Lord, that I'm going to put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. And their sins and iniquities I'm going to remember no more. That's you and me. Now, if you're going to be bowled over by this stuff, then get saved. And when you get saved, when you get born again, just know that there's not a baby, a physical baby. Jesus says what's born of the flesh is flesh, what's born of the spirit is spirit. A baby that is born can never, ever, ever go back inside of his mother's womb. Just like who is born of the spirit can never, ever, ever unbirth themselves either. Now where remission of these is, Jews, there's no more offering for sin. <clears throat> there's no more offering. There's no more offering. There's no more offering. Do you understand what I'm saying, brothers and sisters? There's no more offering. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to try to go to church. Well, how about if you just try and get to church on time? Can, can you do that? I go to well, I go to church, but how many times? How many? How long? How many times do you come on time? Shoot! By these bargains, well, God, oh God, look what I'm doing. God says all of your righteousness is a filthy rag in my eyes. He said, get get that stuff away from me. In the Old Testament, when the Jews were doing the right thing. They were doing it rogue. They weren't doing it with their heart. God said, get those sacrifices away. Who asked you to do that? He says, it's a stench to my nostrils. So having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness, how? By the blood of Jesus. How do we go before the throne of grace? Boldly by the blood of Jesus. By a new living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil. This is to say his flesh. Okay? Jesus sacrificed. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, in a full assurance of faith, in a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled, or, or it, it, it means, it means um, um, washed clean, purified, having our, our hearts cleaned uh, from an evil conscience. Remember now, we can have a good conscience if we want. Having our, having our conscience be, be clean, the evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. So let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Let's believe. I don't understand in my head, uh, eternal, uh, once saved, always saved, but the Bible says it's true. Well, I can show you verses that, no, you can't. Talk to me. Okay, you're wrong. You have fed so you, that stream that you're drinking from. Somebody is peeing in the water upstream and polluting it for you. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Let us believe it. Believe it without wavering. 
because he is faithful this promise when he when jesus said that good work that i started you i'm gonna i'm gonna perform it until until the day i come back well then believe it brothers and sisters gee whiz already <coughs> so let us consider let, let's contemplate one another to provoke unto love and unto good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some are but exhorting encouraging one another and so much more as we see the day approaching because if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth there remains no more sacrifice for sins ah, i'm lost i'm going to hell in your faith see the world's faith is what well i hope it's not going to rain tomorrow you know and and the the christian faith is yeah lord whatever man bring it on man i'll be dancing in the rain you know our faith isn't dependent upon the circumstances around us our faith is that god cares for us and he loves us for for so let's read this now with 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 I read it with earthly eyes. Let's read it with Christian eyes, okay? For if we sin willfully, okay, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, okay, all these things, your sins and iniquities, I'll remember no more. For remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. There's no more offering for sin. There's no more offering for sin, okay? But if we sin willfully, because let's face it, you know, I don't know about you, but I hate to admit it, but I have sinned willfully, okay? But if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. You know why? Because there's no more sacrifices to give. We can't, even if we sin willfully, because everybody does. There's not one person here, the 25 people that are in church today, not one of you has not sinned willfully. We all have. And if you've sinned willfully, don't worry about it. All your sins were forgiven at Calvary, the ones in the past, the ones that are today, and the ones that are going to be tomorrow. Because he says there's no more offering for sin. But, but, there does a certain fearful looking for judgment and fire indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Because he that despised Moses' law, Moses' law, died without mercy. Okay? But we're not dying without mercy. Okay? Judgment. You know, these people are under judgment that don't know Christ. What is judgment? Getting what you deserve. That's the definition of it. What is, what is grace? Not getting what we deserve. What is mercy? Getting what we don't deserve. We get things from God that we don't deserve. And one of those things is eternal life. But he, but he says there's no more offering for sins, but a certain fearful looking for judgment and fire indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, because he that despised uh moses law died without mercy under two or three witness how much more for punishment shall ye uh, be uh, thought worthy who have trodden under the foot uh, the son of god and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has and has done despite unto the spirit of grace in other words if you don't give a rat you know what about what jesus christ did at calvary if if Calvary doesn't mean anything, if you can't look at your Messiah and your Savior and know when the scripture says that when Jesus got to the cross, nobody could tell who was up there. They had beat him so bad. While we were still sinning, he died for us. He went to the cross when he was in Gethsemane. He wasn't praying to get out of the cross. He was praying to get to the cross. Don't, don't let these... these learned birds out there tell you differently jesus when he set his face towards jerusalem he was going to sacrifice himself he wasn't trying to get out of it he knew that he had to get there why well because he knew he was the son of god and he knew this he knew, that. He knew it because his heavenly father said you got to get there and he did everything he needed to do to get to calvary to die for you and me accept it revel in it Throw it up. yoo -hoo! Because the problem today isn't loss of salvation. The problem today is salvation, period. Make sure you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I could go on here, but I'm out of time. You know, how, or of, of how much sore punishment 
shall ye, I'm sorry, how, of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden under foot the Son of God? If you don't care about Jesus, fine, then go ahead and live your life, okay? And expect th this, this fiery judgment and indignation to come upon you. But if we sin as Christians, willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice because Jesus did it all. Man, just accept it. There's nothing that's going to take you out of the Father's hand. There's nothing that's going to take you out of the Savior's hand. There's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. You say, well, I know this. So let's talk about these hypotheticals. I'm out, I'm out of time. Oh, these, what if, what if, what if? Well, what if not? Well, it's not fair. Well, it's not fair for you to say that either. I, the narrative, I can switch to the other side if you'd like. Why don't we just accept what's written? You'll, you'll live a better life. You'll live a happier life. You'll draw closer to the Lord. In fact, the closer you get, the further you'll feel away. Because we just, we just, how can God stand with you? you know? No, you know, forget about can a demon be inside of a Christian. Really? You know, you know what the real question is? How can such a holy, righteous God stand? any one of us. That's the truth. Our hypocrisy, our sham, our, our, our facade, you know, that we put up our, our Christianity, look at me, look at me, and then behind the scenes we do whatever we want. That's the truth. How can God stand us? Oh, wretched people that we are, who's going to deliver us from this body of death? Jesus Christ is. And Paul realized realize that too. Make sure you ask Jesus Christ into your life to save you from your sins. It's real easy. Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me from my sins. If you mean business with him, he'll mean business with you. He'll come and he'll change you. But if you're driven, harassed, and tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior. These are demons in your life. They're slowing down, stopping, or turning around to Christianity. They're destroying your faith. They're making you lethargic. They're just, well, these are demons. Get deliverance from those things. Start doing self-deliverance. A whole bunch of good stuff out there. So I love y'all. We're going to be talking about alcohol on Sunday. And last Sunday, I was all over the place because I was trying to lay a foundation that really needs a couple more uh, uh, messages. But I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go back in that. There's too. There's just too much more to go through. You're gonna. Uh, there can be a lot more clarity uh, in this Sunday. It may go into a next another service. Maybe I can finish up on a Thursday um, or a Sunday. But uh, we need to know about alcohol and drugs and what it's doing to our life and what the Word of God says about that. And then you can make your choice. You know, you can make your choice. You can choose, but don't want you hate, but like, like somebody goofed, you know, because the guy lied to the kid and said, you can just do whatever you want. You don't have to worry about that. And, and this guy was all oh, looking good. He drove a big car and fast car. And, you know, oh, we want all these things that the world has offered, you know, but Satan, Satan is feeding us bad stuff. Don't, don't, do you like being chumped? You know, do, do you, do you like, do you like being suckered? Because I don't. You know, so many Christians are being suckered to not believe that demons can be inside of them. So many Christians are being suckered by preachers who are too lazy or too fearful to find out what, what real deliverance is all about. Because <clears throat> they look at all these phony baloney, uh, um, uh, that one guy, that guy who wears his shirt on backwards, uh, Bob Larson, what an embarrassment to deliverance. He's out there just just to destroy the real ministry of deliverance. I, I can't go on anymore. Listen, I love y'all. I'm going to stop the recording and leave the church open for a little bit. Uh, I love y'all. And hopefully, you know, got Pastor Charlie uh, every day. <laughs> you can have him every single day uh, in your life. But, you know, all, all that stuff coming up. Uh, we'll be back. Uh, our prayer meeting is Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, fellas, if you want to join us. Uh, and, of course, Sunday morning will be our service. Pastor James is out there, too. Love y'all.